Welcome to English Around Us. We will play many games in our program. And while we play, we will learn to speak and understand each other in English. So join us and find out how much you can learn while we play. We have a very special guest with us today, Wing Commander Rakesh Sharma. He was the first Indian to go into space on a Russian launcher in 1984. Did you know that? You all knew that? Yes, yes. He is going to share his very exciting experience with all of us today. Ready? Yes, sir. Good. And how do you all feel this morning? Fit? Thrilled. Thrilled? Are you fit enough to go into space? Yes, yes sir. sir. You want to see some of the pictures which I have here on my laptop? Yes, yeah? sir. Okay. So then, since it's on my laptop and we have just this one screen, it'll be nice if you get up and come and arrange yourselves behind me so that you're all able to see what I'm going to show you. Okay, look at this. This is Yuri Gagarin's statue. He was the first guy who went into space. When we went there, we did a lot of technical training. You know, we had to learn about the spacecraft itself, how it works, and if something were to go wrong, how we are supposed to fix it. In space, there's no gravity. But how does that affect the human body? When, see, here you are, other than you're standing on the ground, right? If I push you like this, you can straighten yourself, right? Yes. How do you do that? Because awesome. you are sensing that your weight is shifting. You know, there are semicircular canals in the head which help you balance and keep yourself straight. But if you don't have weight, like in space, it's zero gravity, you don't have weight, how will you sense? You can't sense. So you can't straight, keep yourself straight. So the body keeps tumbling up and down. And when that happens, the semicircular canals in the ear, they really get agitated. And you start feeling perspiration and those are the symptoms of space sickness. So we needed to train ourselves, train the semicircular canals to adjust to this kind of a situation. So you sit on this chair which goes round and round and you keep moving your head. So initially you can't do it for more than two minutes and then maybe four minutes and then slowly it goes on till your semicircular canals are conditioned and you're ready to go into space. This is uh, called the centrifuge. They put you in this and turn the whole thing around and it is like you're sitting in a car and you're going fast and you turn the wheel. What happens? Your body goes to the other side, right? You get pressed. So similarly, over here, when this is going around at very high speed, you're pressed into the seat. Now, the problem with that is that when you are pressed into the seat, there's, it's an invisible force which is acting on you. That is called the G-force. It happens when you accelerate very fast. And that is what happens when you are going into space. Remember that your launcher, your rocket is on the launch pad with zero speed. And it has got to reach orbit, which is 500 kilometers away. And it takes only about eight minutes to reach there. So the acceleration is very high. So wherever there is acceleration, there is this G-force, invisible force acting on your chest. So your body weight increases. If four Gs are acting, that means your body weight goes to four times. If I'm 60 kilos, it becomes 240 kilos. Even the rib cage becomes heavy. So it presses against the spine. So the lungs do not have any place to expand. So how do you breathe? You train for that situation in the centrifuge. Okay? You feel like Superman in space <laughs> because you don't have any weight, no gravity. So you, you're flying, so you want to go from here to there, you just push the wall and you just keep going, floating that way, right? <laughs> then we've done a lot of work on the simulator, basically to find out 
how to go through the launch sequence, the docking, undocking, and re-entry into the atmosphere. So a lot of procedures are there. And when we are doing these procedures, these instructors out here, they keep pressing these red buttons and giving us emergencies because they want to see, suppose things don't work, how is this crew going to react to that situation? This is sea survival training. Suppose the spacecraft while returning lands on sea and not on Earth. Uh, it could be anywhere. It could be in the Arctic Ocean, Antarctica. So this is where we train how to get out of that situation. This is the rocket as it is going towards the launch pad. Here it is put up, pointing towards the sky. We are having a look at our seats, which we occupied during the launch and the re-entry. Each seat is built to the body contour of each cosmonaut, each astronaut. Because when you are getting pressed into the seat and your body weight increases by a factor of four, if your seat has got any pointed edges, then that's going to be very painful, right? Because you'll be pushed into it. This is uh, the apparatus with which we did our experiments. One of the experiment was yoga. Then uh, on the day of the flight, you start going towards the launch pad, change into your pressure suit. And after that, get up on this lift, which takes you to the capsule, which is right on top of the launcher. And when the time comes to leave the Earth, the engine, the rumble, the sound, the vibration, this is where the acceleration starts. The G-forces build up, breathing becomes difficult. But eight minutes later, you're in orbit and your body weight from say 240 goes to zero in an instant, in an instant, absolutely. So we went and docked with the laboratory, which was already in orbit. And this is a shot of uh, the capsule coming in just before the docking with the laboratory. Some yogic asanas being done in space by me. Like I told you, this was one of the experiments. Here, we are having dinner. Okay, I'm upside down. My crewmate is the right side up. It is all the same for us uh, while eating. Since there's no gravity, you can be pointing any way. How does the food go in when uh, there's no gravity? Okay, how does it go in? Yeah. Suppose you stand on your head now and I give you something to eat. Will you be able to swallow it? A bit difficult. No, but it will happen. Why? Because it all depends on muscular action. Gravity has nothing to do with eating. Once you put food in your mouth and you chew it and then you swallow it, then that morsel of food is moving down the food pipe with the help of muscles. Muscles overcome gravity. And as far as the digestive system is concerned, it does not know whether you're in space or on ground. Thankfully, otherwise you won't be able to eat. This is the rim of the earth. Note that the sky is black. It's a day shot, but the sky is black. Why? Why should the sky be black? Because you're above the atmosphere. The sky is blue because you're looking at the sky from Earth and there's a lot of moisture in the atmosphere, right? That gives it the blue tint. But when you're above the atmosphere at 500 kilometers per hour, the atmosphere is below you and you look up, the sky is black. Beautiful shot, isn't it? Yes, sir. Now, this is the most beautiful sight from space. You're looking at the solar panel and the solar panel suddenly becomes golden. While you're still watching it, you will see the earth, just a line, a blue line. As you look, that blue turns to yellow, orange, green. It goes through the color spectrum and suddenly, this is what you see. The sun peeping out from behind the earth, quite like a diamond. Very pretty, isn't it? Yes, sir. Okay, and then when we finished, our flight, we moved all our stuff back into the capsule. We undocked from the laboratory and we started our 
engines which slowed us down because we now started flying slower the earth's gravity started pulling us towards earth and we came back when we came back there was a lot of friction because we were now going through the atmosphere but traveling at a at a very high speed so with that friction the whole capsule was covered in flames but the heat never traveled inside and when you are at about 30000 feet this parachute opened and here is the capsule with three of us sitting in it the whole capsule comes down with the help of this parachute that's it that's the space flight good you enjoyed the slide show yes sir right Okay, who's going to ask the first question? How were you selected as an astronaut? Well, um, the Russians who we flew with. Uh, the thing is, we didn't have very much of time. The the flight needed to be performed uh, within about eighteen months from the time it was accepted. So they needed to select people who were familiar with the, at least aircraft systems because. spacecraft systems are just an extension of aircraft systems so they searched from amongst the pilots of the indian air force and then narrowed it down from amongst test pilots so i was a test pilot at that time and i was young and i was fit and i was the right guy at the right place at the right time that's how i got selected How does it feel to be the first astronaut astronaut from India? Well, it it <laughs> you feel very lucky because you know how many of us are here, and uh, I've never won a lottery in my life, but this was the biggest lottery. Feels good. Were you frightened to make this journey? I wasn't afraid of the space flight itself, but during the flight, especially when we returned, when the parachute opened. at that point you i showed you all those rigging lines which were ending up it was a metallic ring and the capsule is shaped like a bell so at 30000 feet when you're traveling at that speed and the parachute opens there's a shock and the the capsule keeps turning around and those rigging lines and the ring keeps moving and the whole sound gets amplified inside the capsule and i was certain that the parachute is going to tear away and part company with the capsule at that time yes i i was a bit scared that will we survive this so i hope that answers your question so i wasn't afraid of the flight itself but during the flight this is what happened is it difficult to sleep in space it's not difficult uh, i'll tell you what happens uh, you first have to use a sleeping bag you get into a sleeping bag zip it up just make sure you tie the sleeping bag to some part of the ship <laughs> otherwise you will keep floating around you know it will be a moving experience your weightless <laughs> sleeping bag is weightless right and if you don't tie it then then you keep moving around so that's unusual the other thing which is difficult is that if you're tired all day you've spent working in the evening on earth what happens is as you lie down there is that sense of relief that there is no more weight on my legs you know and i'm now resting in space you do not feel that difference so there's no sense of psychological relief that you've laid yourself down so that is different so you zip up in a sleeping bag crouch artificially load yourself and then go to sleep if you don't have a problem sleeping on earth you won't have a problem speak, sleeping in space <laughs> what is the food that you took it took to space well uh, we were very lucky uh, we could choose from 80 dishes there were 80 types of uh, food where, whether they were uh, rice preparations dry fruits juices and they were all stacked up in in the in a special area in the spacecraft in the laboratory which was already in orbit and all we needed to do was okay today i feel like eating this take it out there's a uh, there was an oven there heat it up and 5 minutes later 
a hot food is ready. It's in a tin. You open the cap, take some plastic spoon and, and consume your food. No problem. Yeah, water and liquids is a bit of a problem. Because uh, if you take it in a glass and then it drops, <laughs> then, you know, because of the surface tension of the water, it, it remains like a sphere and it keeps floating around. <laughs> now, that's bad news if that happens because then there are so many computers and things. And so what do you do? It happened once. Then they had a conference and they said, OK, if you put a towel in it and try to catch it, then it will break into so many small spheres. That won't work. So these three astronauts stood around that sphere and sucked up the water. <laughs> so that, that doesn't happen. What you've got is you've got a canister which dispenses water under pressure. So you've got a pipe with a spout at the end. Put that spout in the mouth, press a button, water is delivered to your mouth under pressure. And from that point onwards, as we had explained, muscular action takes it in. So that's, that's how you eat and drink in space. So where is the next question? How do you go to the bathroom? <laughs> yeah? Yeah. No problem. It's the same way. It's just that what do you do with the body wastes that come out? So the solid wastes are done in a rubber bag and tied up and then you put the waste in an aluminium container, which periodically you jettison out into space. Yeah. And that slowly, it keeps going around the earth and keeps losing height. And finally, it enters the atmosphere and burns up. All those, some of the shooting stars which you see is actually human waste returning back to earth. <laughs> and some of you must have crossed the your wish. fingers and made a wish. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Any other question? Yeah. Was there any recreation in this uh, in the space travel? You did recreation. Yeah. Um, in the eighties, um, we had video cassettes. We had a video player uh, up there. So uh, we used to watch movies. Didn't have very much of free time. We had our audio Walkmans. Uh, we had taken so our personal music. So you could put on the earphones and, and listen to some music. That's about it. You can't go out for a walk. You know? yeah. OK, yes? How do, you how do you bathe in the spacecraft? Well, you can't bathe in space. Uh, you can, of course. But it's, the thing is that you have to carry the water from Earth to bathe over there. So it, it, it's not a very viable and economical way of doing things. It's very expensive to take anything up in space. So we've got these uh, uh, towels with, with a bit of savlon in it and things. So you give yourself a rub so that you know the bacteria doesn't take hold. So you don't bathe. You do only a dry clean in space. Yeah. How many times did you go around the world? 17 times a day. Eight days, so do the mathematics. 136. Correct. So I've been around the earth 136 times in those eight days. And what it gets you to see is uh, 136 sunrises and 136 sunsets, right? It takes 90 minutes to go around the earth once. So I showed you those pictures of a sunrise. So you see that sunrise. And if you've missed it, wait 90 minutes and you'll see it again. <laughs> wait 45 minutes, you'll see a sunset in reverse. Wait 45 minutes, you see another sunrise. Great experience. So you all want to go into space? Yes. Yeah? OK, good. Could you see any monument on earth? You are probably uh, alluding to, referring to the Great Wall of China. Well, um, I did not look out for the Great Wall of China because whenever we were flying over India, we were doing some experiment or the other. So we were busy shutting down those experiments. So I didn't look out for it. But I can imagine any object which 
has linearity and which has a color contrast can be seen from space from the heights we were flying at. For example, you can see an airliner flying over the ocean only because the exhaust condenses, right? There's a white line. So there's a long white line seen against the blue of the ocean and you can pick that out. If there's a railway line on a desert because it goes for kilometers, so that black line against the beige colored of the desert, you can see it. Anything that has linearity and which has a color contrast can be seen from space. But you can't see cities, you can't see Bangalore, Bombay, nothing. You don't see the detail. What else did you see in space? Looking outwards? Yes. Yeah? Oh, it's about the same what you see. Because remember that the stars and the planets are light years away, thousands of kilometers, and I was only 500 kilometer closer to them than you are, right? So I didn't see very much more than what you did. What I did see was a, a sight which was clearer than what you see, because when you are viewing these objects, you're viewing them through the atmospheric layer, and I was above the atmosphere. So stars would not twinkle, they were pinpoints of light. That's the difference. What did India look like? Well, um, this is the same question which Mrs. Gandhi had asked, and I had no hesitation at that time to, to answer her by saying that India looked sare jahan se acha. Uh, of course, one always feels that one's country is the best, but if I uh, let you know why I said that, it is because uh, from space, India, the entire peninsula region, there's so much of coastline and you see it set off against the beautiful blue sea. And uh, then there's a lot of greenery along the coastline. Then as you start going from south to north, as we did, it starts becoming brown, the Deccan Plateau. Then going further on, you, it's the golden color of the desert, uh, uh, Rajasthan desert, etc. Then the Gangetic Plain becomes green again, go further north, and you come to the Himalayas, which from that height, look purple actually because the sun cannot get down into the valleys and then the snow-capped mountains. So really it's a beautiful sight absolutely. And uh, all of this you see about a minute and a half as you go past India. It was wonderful. It was a lovely sight indeed. Uh, well to be fair even uh, uh, Africa looked very pretty from space. What did our planet look like? Our planet is really the most beautiful planet in the universe, right? Because uh, it's about the only place where uh, the environment supports life, as you know. Uh, it's, I won't say it's the only place, it's the only known place. Uh, so it looks like really a, a blue marble against a black sky. And uh, there are white uh, patches around which really are cloud patches. So the earth looks absolutely beautiful. And uh, what it tells you is that, really speaking, there are, there are no borders drawn on earth. Borders have been drawn by us. So whoever has been into space gets this feeling that the earth is one, and so should be the people on it. And uh, as Gandhiji had often said that the earth has enough for everybody's need, but not enough for everybody's greed, right? So it, it is evident that, that the environment must be protected so that all of us and our generations, which are yet to come, your children, the children of your children, have something to use from this earth so that their lives can be as fulfilling as ours is. We have everything. So we should not be wasting non-renewable uh, energy sources. We must conserve our forests. Everything which our forefathers knew, I think we, sh we need to remember that because there is no other place for miles and miles around. And if we spoil the environment of planet Earth, there is nowhere else to go. Okay. 
Yeah. Are there any courses and things that you have to do to become an astronaut? Well, uh, it, it depends what role you want to play in the space game. Do you want to be a researcher? Do you want to be one who is going to be the commander of the ship? Are you going to be a scientist who's, you know, who can think up of some experiments? Or you want to help with the control system, somebody who makes those uh, uh, spacecraft which go into space? Or you want to be a communications engineer? You see, there are so many uh, various roles which are there. So choose the one which excites you, and then take up those subjects and prepare yourself for that career. Keep in touch with ISRO, and uh, whatever has to happen will certainly happen. So wish you all the best in your future careers. Thank, Thank you, sir. You're most welcome, and I hope to see you all in space soon. <laughs>